about three years ago, I was in Barcelona and um, kind of on a little mini vacation. And we were climbing up those uh, hills where the Olympic uh, Stadium is and um, kind of a nice little natural setting uh, through uh, little pathways that go uh, snaking up and uh, up a small hill. On a very hot day, kind of uh, thirsty and dehydrated, we, we stopped at uh, the Miro Museum, which is uh, most of the way up there. And uh, really just to have some water, use the washroom, what have you, take a break. And uh, happened to walk into the, you know, the bookstore, gift store, uh, gift shop at the uh, entrance of the gallery and uh, or the museum. And uh, found myself just kind of leafing through the books uh, that were on display there. I, I uh, went through some uh, uh, books regarding uh, uh, artists that I was familiar with, some that I was not at all familiar with. Uh, looked at some books on art and advertising, uh, you know, political art. Uh, there was um, erotic art. There was, uh, in fact, one uh, book of photography by... I think his name was Hausman or Hauser. I got to look that up. Uh, had a book full of photos of basically just uh, uh, women in underwear. It seemed uh, just the lower parts of it. Just they look like home <laughs> uh, iPhone shots. But uh, there was something about them that uh, kind of titillated, uh, that excited, that kind of added to the uh, uh, the energy levels within me that were starting to to grow. I, I looked at some. Uh, books on, um, you know, some grotesque art that kind of piqued other parts of me and other cycles within me were starting to be uh, uh, generated. Uh, I remember looking at some comic strips about uh, about a dying dog that was kind of bizarre and absurd and tragic, and uh, that started, uh, you know, sparking a whole bunch of other things going on within me. And um, what I noticed was after a few minutes, I found myself getting kind of overwhelmed. Um, you know, feeling very excited, enthusiastic, kind of happy and ecstatic in a way. But at the same time, I could feel it kind of getting getting out of hand. It felt like I was about to uh, uh, be overwhelmed by it. And what I needed to do at that moment was to leave. And uh, I quickly got out of there because I felt like I was just about to... Uh, you know, have my head explode in some kind of metaphorical sense. And I left the bookstore, went into the little uh, entranceway lobby of the museum and sat there with my head inside my hands and uh, just started crying. And uh, something just started coming out of me. I was just kind of a rush of emotions, of uh, enthusiasm, of, of regret, of tragedy, of everything all at once. And uh, what really kind of spurred that was uh, as I was leaving the the bookstore, I felt like I wanted to know everything. I wanted to learn about all of those artists. I wanted to, uh, you know, do some of that work. I had some ideas for, uh, you know, social projects, art projects, music projects. Everything was just kind of flooding in, and I wanted to do all of it at once. And uh, And this was kind of an extreme version of something that happens to me on a more limited scale. Uh, I tend to find that when things are going well for me, when things are actually happening in a kind of an exciting way, I, I tend to kind of get maybe a little overexcited, uh, a little overwhelmed. I tend to kind of shut down a little bit. And um, I don't know if this is a dysfunction or, or something that, uh, that, I need to knew, that I need to do in order to... Uh, I don't know, to protect myself from uh, overwhelming. But uh, that clearly happened that day, and it happened in a kind of an extreme way, and I, I more or less sat there for almost an hour just kind of whimpering and uh, all these ideas flooding uh, into me. And um, and what's interesting about that is that I, I would describe that experience, uh, I would later come to describe that experience as, as uh, somewhat uh, of, a, of a psychedelic state that I was in. And uh, this was before I actually started experimenting with uh, with the psychedelics. This was about three years ago. And uh, what's uh, kind of interesting is that uh, might have precipitated this was in about a month or maybe even a few weeks after I was to come back home to Toronto, there was plans to uh, take part in an ayahuasca ceremony. So... It's kind of curious that, uh, you know, a few weeks before I'm, I'm to take part in what's to be a very profound psychedelic experience that I, I actually have one 
uh, more or less uh, a psychedelic experience without ingesting anything. It's simply, uh, you know, walking on a hot day, um, looking at all kinds of interesting uh, art and creative things that are happening, all compressed within a physical space of a bookstore and all the shelves that contained multitudes of images and ideas uh, that kind of triggered in me a psychedelic state. And what happened uh, during that one hour of whimpering with my head in my hands, and um, I was with my uh, girlfriend at the time, and she was very understanding and, you know, more or less sat there supportive and uh, and uh, allowed me to go through this, and I'm thankful for that as well. And during that, uh, and this is why, I mean, normally if something like that uh, would happen to me, and um, and I and I think Similar things have happened to me in the past, but what I would normally do is, and what I did in the past was kind of brush it aside, kind of take a deep breath and say, you know, suck it up and just walk on. And and uh, I would probably have just left that uh, museum and kept walking and, uh, you know, more or less just not really dealt with it. But in this case, I let myself, uh, you know, basically whimper for an hour. <laughs> And during this, I'm thinking of certain things. And some of the things that I, I thought during that very uh, experience uh, are the things that are coming about uh, in my life. And and I, you know, I had thought about uh, doing something with this uh, space that I live in. Uh, I, you know, some of these ideas had popped into my head before. But during that experience, I kind of solidified them and said, you know what, when I get back, I'm going to I'm going to start to to make some of these ideas into reality. I'm going to I'm going to start to you know develop and curate a, a space where people can come in and uh, hang out and talk and make art and make music. And I'm going to generate the space <clears throat> uh through the sheer will and idea of of uh wanting to do it. And uh and I did start to do those things after that experience. And I did have an ayahuasca experience a few weeks after. And, um, what I, you know, when you, when you go into an ayahuasca ceremony, they, um, the shaman asks you to, <clears throat> the shaman asks you to, uh, think of an intention or, uh, something that you're trying to deal with or solve or, uh, address during your experience. And for me, the thing that I brought to the fore of my mind and uh, as an intention was to try and understand and deal with this uh, thing that has been going on within me as long as I can remember, uh, which was kind of a an inner battle, if you will, between what uh, I could simplistically call my intellectual side and my emotional side. Let's call it that. Let's break it down into a bifurcation of two uh, I've since uh, come to realize, obviously, that there's, uh, to me, there's a lot more layers in us. There's a lot more cycles. There's a lot more sides to us. Uh, there's a lot more what you might call even proto beings within us that are kind of swimming around and cycling around and working together to become what is you yourself. And uh, in that uh, ayahuasca ceremony, I, I asked myself uh, about this this battle and what it all meant and how I should be seeing it and dealing with it, addressing it, internalizing it. And uh, uh, what I found was I, I got a lot of images of um, blood in a way, uh, redness and blackness. And, uh, I saw images and, uh, hallucinations of a, what appeared to be a female figure kind of, uh, you know, floating and slithering almost like a flying and kind of like a snake. And, uh, I guess there's some weird kind of biblical thing going on there, even though, uh, you know, I grew up an atheist, it kind of felt like, uh, kind of felt like the garden of Eden and a, and a, and a snake was kind of uh, coming to you and trying to, uh, talk to you and convince you. And in fact, it felt like a seduction in a strange sort of way. It felt like this uh, entity that I was engaging with, communicating with, which uh, of course you can say is an avatar of myself, or if you want to be more broad, you can say it's an avatar uh, or aspect of the universe that uh, is kind of communicating with itself, which is one agent myself and another one, this 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 image, this avatar that I'm seeing. And uh, it felt like this entity was soothing me, calming me, you know, stroking me, and uh, 
pretty much telling me that it was okay to kind of go into this, uh, go into the body and go into uh, the emotions and to, and to feel them. And uh, I got to a stage where I felt like, uh, you know, I, I believed it. I uh, started to internalize it. I get to this uh, point where I'm about to essentially let go and surrender in a way, if you will. And um, this has happened to me several times since then. I've had uh, various uh, psychedelic experiences, and, and usually uh, this is typically when I'm uh, uh, on a mushroom trip. I get to a similar place. I get to a place, and it's usually early on in the trip. I, it's like uh, I'm visited, and before I realize it, I find myself you know, getting calmed and soothed and, and about to, you know, let's say metaphorically open a door in which I can sense that beyond this door, there's going to be, uh, it sounds hippy dippy, sure, but it feels like there's kind of a universal joy that's just ready for me to just jump into kind of surrender and, uh, and float away. Uh, it seems like immense happiness that's just around the corner. And just when I'm about to just let go and surrender and, and, metaphorically open that door and go into it and you know right at that last instance something just kind of pops into my mind and and kind of jars me and and the message is something to the effect of what if she's lying what if it's a trick what if i'm being deceived what if i won't come back what if this is actually what death is like <laughs> you know that if you let go maybe you let go forever all of these kind of fears that just pop in and these are uh, kind of these built-in cycles within us that uh, are there to protect us. Uh, you know, they're evolutionarily um, uh, built-in processes that uh, that keep us safe in some cases. But um, in this case, um, you know, when I'm out of that state, I, I think back and I think, you know, it's just a psychedelic state. Uh, if I do let go, I'm going to be okay. No one's really had any issues in, in similar circumstances. And, and the people that do let go in those cases tend to uh, report back that it's a wonderful experience and a life-changing and altering uh, uh, experience. But uh, I have actually never been able to take that step over. I've had some incredibly potent psychedelic experiences. But every time I get to that point, I, I just don't take the last step. And uh, so I feel like there's there's more for me to do. I'm kind of curious about it. I'm a little, uh, maybe a little scared as well, because, you know, there's still that, uh, that fear that, hey, maybe it's, maybe it's a step too far. Or maybe it's a step that I won't come back from. Um, but, you know, over the years, I, I've, I've learned to uh, deal better with my <clears throat> conflict between my intellect and my emotions. And, um, it wasn't much of a battle in that uh, over the years, my intellect really had won out and uh, to such an extent that I didn't really respect my emotional responses and my emotional experiences. I, I felt like they were uh, states of being that needed to be overcome, avoided, um, you know, not paid great attention to lest they lead you astray. <clears throat> I've uh, since learned that uh, these are actually probably more akin to superpowers that we have <laughs> that I had that I was not really paying attention to. And since then, I, I I've, have been paying more attention to it. My life has been, I would say, fuller. Uh, my experiences have been richer. Uh, I believe I've been able to connect with people a little bit, uh, a lot better, I think, uh, than I used to be able to. Um, uh, so it's kind of worked for me. And um you know, I talked to some of my friends about this, and uh, one of these uh, guys that I've, I've probably talked uh, at length about such things was, uh, was Robin Uchida, and um, we had him on as, uh, as a guest on Turtles All the Way Down, and um, we had a nice discussion after breakfast, and um, a very interesting guy. He teaches at the OCAD University. It's kind of an art and design college university in uh, Toronto. Uh, he teaches an interesting class that's uh, somewhat uh, unique, I, I think, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, you know, not so much the technique of art, but uh, some of the more, what I would call the more fundamental comportment of, of artists or creative or innovative thinking uh, of an artist to the world. So we had uh, we had a fun conversation, um, probably a couple of hours long. I hope you enjoy it. Talk soon. 
So uh, we just had breakfast. Thank you. Yeah, that was fun. I had a good conversation. Thank already. you for paying. <laughs> it was a lot, you know, yeah. purple onion. <laughs> So we're talking a lot about, uh, I mean, you teach at OCAD. I do. And uh, you teach at an institution that is focused on art and design. And it's interesting because uh, I was remarking on, on the kind of courses that you teach uh, don't seem to be within the regular stream of courses that you might find at an art school in that you're not teaching them how to, you know, uh, use a brush or to do a sculpture or do any kind of technique or something. I think what you're dealing with is probably the more important fundamental comportment of, of an artist to the world. That's what it seems like to me from the outside. Is, is well, that what you're dealing with? That's the argument. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if it's true. I, I think there are probably more institutions, uh, even outside of the art field, mm -hmm. that uh, are looking at design more deeply as a, obviously, as design thinking, things like this. Um, they are alternative ways of, of approaching things, mm -hmm. different, uh, bringing on new processes, new awarenesses and so on, and bring them into, you know, existing disciplines. So um, it's definitely not, you know, strictly OCAD or strictly art institutions, I don't think. Hmm. So, But uh, the courses that you teach, they tend to be more senior students? Um, no. Or no? <laughs> I, I really don't think it matters, but hmm. I... I they happen to be second-year students. Yeah, because I was going to say it would be better to get them early. <laughs> you know, that's an interesting... Hmm. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Hmm. I, I, I think... Um, I, I think for what we're after, we're all after, um, there's sort of the requisite uh, uh, experience of life, you know, outside of the institution... Um, uh, alternative awarenesses, things like that, influences and so on that, you know, are outside of um, high school curriculum and things like that. So, you know, the more of that that's going on, the better. Uh, because I feel, it's my experience that the individuals seemed more primed mm -hmm. for, for what is about <clears throat> to take place. And right. they have no idea. And I think that's one of the uh, interesting things about the course is they don't know what to expect. Mm. You know, it's it's not predictable. And is it different every year that you're what you're doing, or do you try to? Uh, you know, there it, must be it some evolves. Good ones I literally, while I do have particular things that I do, I evolve the way that they happen because you know what? Uh, um, I I try to present a situation that's experimental for them and experimental for me, which is is the case. I mean, it's like a lab, right? Mm. And I think that uh, each time um, something. I was explored, created, experienced, and so on. You, you just get new insights, so you can modify things. But I do every every term. I kind of start from scratch. Actually, mm -hmm. I re-evaluate. <coughs> so um, now, are you noticing any kind of changes within the student body as they come through your uh, classroom over the years? Is there? Um, I like to talk about youth. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. I, I really don't know because I, it's hard to say because I've been changing too. Mm. Uh, it's been about seven or eight years, I guess. So um, I think the context has changed somewhat. I think, you know, uh, there are rapid changes because of apps and things mm. like this, you know, the things that are influencing uh, literally the day to day 24 uh, uh, 7 appears. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. That would be a very hard thing to measure. I'm sure people are measuring that. Mm. Uh, but I think it's, you know, for what I'm doing, it's kind of irrelevant, actually, because mm -hmm. it still comes down to an individual and, you know, their potential. So, so it varies greatly from uh, subject to subject, subject matter, uh, student to student. Uh, now, you know, I, I went to school for philosophy. And, and when you tell somebody that you went to school for philosophy, they always say, oh, that was useful or that, that must have got you a great job or something like that. I'm thinking that that kind of a response also happens uh, to art students, but not necessarily design students. It seems to be work for design, but there's really not much work for art. Well, I should, I should, uh, I should add that uh, the students are from different disciplines. Mm. So they're all represented mm. in this class. 
um, and they all are meant to get the same value because I think it's relevant to, every, to you know, any of the applications. And as, uh, you know, um, I, I think because of some of the fundamentals that go on uh, in, in the class, uh, it can apply to anything, philosophy mm-hmm. in particular, actually, you mm-hmm. know, which is uh, sort of themed um, throughout the course, although I don't, you know, point fingers at it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, essentially, you know, one of my, my biggest influences lately has been uh, Hofstetter because of his book on analogies. Hmm. So I use analogy a lot, you know, because I think it, it's a right, great way for people to, uh, for students to... Uh, the Hofstetter that wrote Gerda Lescher Bach? That's right. Okay. And yeah, uh, The Strange Loop. Hofstetter. I Am a Strange Loop. Yeah. yeah, I think the book was called Surfaces and Essences. Oh, I'm not familiar with that one. Oh. Yeah, it's more recent. And he essentially draws a lot of attention to the, the function of analogy. Hmm. You know? And uh, so I'm, I'm literally integrating um, those thoughts hmm. into uh, how I practice, actually. So. And how do you do that? What, uh, what are you getting out of that? It's, it's a kind of a, a, almost a mathematical understanding of analogy, because he tends no, to come no, from no, that, uh, that end no, of things. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, okay. it's a pretty simple idea. Hmm. Only I think we've been treating... You know, the analogy he talks about is the analogy you know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, I think once you sort of address it, um, there are other kinds of possibilities. So what I do is I take, um, uh, I look for, for instances where there is potential for new constructs mm. so that I can appropriate <laughs> those constructs and apply them as analogies hmm. in other contexts, right? So, um, you know, something that may happen, for example, in quantum physics mm-hmm. um, is interesting if you, well, it's interesting in itself, but it's interesting if you then overlay it in another context mm-hmm. and see what happens because it's a, because it's a different... Uh, notion of reality, you know, oh, yeah. all of this subatomic mm-hmm. event. Uh, so. Well, I'm finding a, a lot of people um, jumping onto that bandwagon, if I may call it that, in that um, there seems to be more of a popular understanding or at least an exposure to quantum mechanical theory. And a lot of people are getting a lot out of it that maybe not is not even there. But uh, I take your point that in that metaphorically, at least, or a way of understanding, you don't necessarily need to know the, the math of it or anything. It's the structure of that analogy that makes it useful to understand other things. Well, I'm trying to disrupt my own con- construct. Right. That's a good way to go. That's, That's how you I'm learn. To do. Yeah. So, so that, you know, there's an option, right? It doesn't have to be true. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't even have to be real. <laughs> it just has to be different from my habitual way of seeing things, right? Mm-hmm. And, and therein lies the opportunity, right? So in des- art and design, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, sort of a foundation. You, you want to be able to put on different lenses. You want right. to be able to imagine, you know, an entirely different pathway. Mm-hmm. Right? So, and that applies in both cases, right? So whether, I mean, you know, obviously the, the OCAD, breaks design up into industrial design, environmental, and so on. In the art field, there's different materials, skills, requ- skill requirements, mm-hmm. and, and so on. Uh, but they still require this, the lens, you know. So, what do we, you know, what is that? You know, what is yours? Do you know, you know, and, mm. and relative to what, you know, and so on. So it, it becomes a you know, a really interesting personal exploration. Mm-hmm. And hopefully there is some um, uh, usable knowledge at the end of it, you know, usable experience. Tell me more about quantum mechanic and how that, uh, how you're seeing it and how you're applying it or... Well, I don't, I don't know yeah. it well. I mean, I, yeah. I'm reading about it and I'm not wanting to know it well because well, yeah. it's pretty mm-hmm. <laughs> difficult. Mm-hmm. I think it's strictly on the analogy mm-hmm. level to think less in terms of 
particles, let's say. Mm -hmm. Discrete. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Particles and discrete moments and time is another and issue. And to yeah. imagine, in terms of waves, to imagine, uh, and, and, you know, all of these peculiar events mm -hmm. at the same time are, are, you know, uh, initially they seem ridiculous, you know, mm. like they're, they're unacceptable. Counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. absolutely. And counter reality. Right. Or right? whatever that is, right? No, yeah. well, yeah. counter my own reality, right. counter my own uh, construct, that is, right? <laughs> so, so I want to sort of confront it and somehow um, accept or surrender to the, the idea and see if I can uh, make use of it in my own way. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I think, the great lessons in, in trying to understand this way of thinking is that it, it kind of opens up the um, the fact that uh, certainty is not what you might think it was. And uh, especially when you go into different scales uh, and you go small or you go large, you know, turtles all the way down or turtles all the way up, you start to notice that there's different processes at play, that uh, when you get down to the quantum level... It's not a Newtonian mechanics. It's not uh, certainty in that uh, this electron is here. It's actually a statistical range that you're given that it's likely to be here or here, and you don't really know it until you measure it. And so it's kind of a whole different way of looking at, as you say, reality. Yeah. So yeah. you know, as you run through, you know, that uh, that construction, actually, mm. you know, uh, that interpretation, um, you can't look at everything else the same way. So, mm -hmm. so I, have, I have a perfect example of this. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, a tree in my living room. Wow. That's about seven <clears throat> feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I've been nurturing it back to health because it was sort of failing on one side and this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I've been sitting on the living room couch looking at the tree uh, for periods of like 15, 20 minutes. Mm. Just staring at the Commu tree. Communing with it? Or just, are you trying to and my understand children, it? My children yeah. haven't, you know, uh, called the police or anything. <laughs> uh, so they, they're pretty accepting. But I've been doing this a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I noticed was that um, I know it's growing. Mm -hmm. I, I see new branches. Um, I see new leaves. But I don't see it growing. Mm -hmm. I don't see the motion of it because the you know any of the, that motion is imperceptible. Time right? scale is vastly different. No, it's, than it's ours. beyond. Yeah. It's beyond mm -hmm. you know perceptibility for us. Mm -hmm. right? um, on the other end of that, you have photosynthesis going on, mm. which is going on at about the speed of light. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or thereabouts. <laughs> Pretty darn fast, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's happening inside that. Lilf, leaf, sorry, that's that's completely motionless. Wow. As far as I can tell. <clears throat> so it appears, yeah. Imperceptible. Mm -hmm. Right. So within this, you know, very narrow range of what I can perceive, uh, this plant is doing nothing. <laughs> when in fact, it's doing many things. Right. right. So it's, it's kind of, that in itself is just sort of this... The strange thing to me, right? Mm -hmm. And what uh, obviously it's it's our our range of uh, uh, perceiving motion, you know, is limited and so on, right? But what if it's different, mm. right? And what if you could uh, see the plant grow and see it move? And you've seen the time lapse videos of plants, and yeah, how they amazing. move, and so it you you literally interpret that event in a different way. Mm -hmm. You you interpret that thing in a different way. It almost well, it looks it looks alive on our terms. Mm -hmm. More alive on our terms, right? It looks like behavior. It know, looks like decision see, making to turn towards at, the sun or, at the yeah. point the thing is watered, mm -hmm. right? The leaves just, you know, uh perk up, you know, and, and then they relax and then it gets watered again and it's growing, it's moving, it's right. It's behavior. Right. Mm. So, um, so what if, what if we could see that going on all around us as we mm. walk, walk through a park, you know, this type of thing, how would that change the experience mm. and our relationship with those plants? Right. Vastly, I would guess. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because so, we see them as inert things that we walk past yeah. rather than living creatures that you can yeah. uh, commune with in some sense. And I would, I would attribute just noticing this, which is not, I mean, it's not a new idea. It's just mm. something I never noticed before, that's all. But mm. I, it's a result of, of sort of testing myself with mm. uh, the analogies that I was driving from uh, quantum physics, right? right? One of the other interesting things when you think about uh, electrons and you think about a tree, uh, I mean, they're um, like an electron is kind of interesting because it seems like every electron is really the same electron in the sense that they are all from the same field and they just kind of pop in and out of the field. But at base, a level that we don't really have access to this field, they're connected in some sense. So they're the same thing in some sense. Uh, when you see a forest of trees... Um, They look like individual entities, but at root, many of them are connected uh, in vast networks that are not visible to us, but are playing an important part in their lives and their growth. And uh, we talked briefly about this uh, uh, podcast, I think it was uh, Radiolab, that a scientist was talking about how uh, a forest of trees is connected underground by a network of mushroom-like, you know, string connectivity or tubes, and they're directing traffic and essentially making decisions about where the nutrients go and doing kind of a a trading economics. Uh, Like it gives something to the tree and the tree gives something back to that network and the network then uh, spreads it around. Um, But uh, all that is going on that's kind of uh, below ground uh, in more ways than one. Well, for my purposes, for for if if this is about the course that we're talking about, Mm. uh, the idea, the very idea of connectivity uh, is is the one we explore, mm-hmm. right? Um, you you make of it whatever you've experienced. So, what does connect mean, right? Mm-hmm. I heard a, um, a physicist talked about talk about the fact. Yes, indeed. You know, based on his experience and so on, he's verified that we are connected mm-hmm. uh, throughout the universe and mm-hmm. so on. But he he added to that, we we are defined. By the other, right? Mm. We're not just connected. Like Marcel Buber. We are defined by the other, right? Mm. So, and I love that actually, mm-hmm. because um, connected just feels well, our, you know, uh, relative to that, connected feels empty. Yeah, connected defined. seems like you're, you're kind of independent and uh, separate beings that are somehow connected, yeah. but rather it's that that connection is what defines you as you. Exactly. Right. So, uh, you know, okay, so we've, we've just discussed a, a spectrum of uh, possible ways to interpret connect, right? Mm-hmm. Connect and connectivity. Uh, mm-hmm. When a student walks in the door and I use the word connected, what would you imagine they're thinking, mm. right? They're obviously... Um, they might think Facebook now. I mean, it's uh, connected digitally. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a very common way for and people would, to be And that would be connected. their, you know, frequency, let's say, mm. of understanding, right? Uh, which, like, you know, my experience with the tree, you know, yeah. could either be, you know, rather inert and irrelevant, or it could be really curious and significant and worth exploring. Right? Mm-hmm. So um, I think um, that word connected is, I mean, that's worth, wow, that's yeah. worth a, a course in itself, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, unfortunately, we don't get the, the time or the opportunity. But Do you think we're less connected or less aware of our connections? Because I mean, there seems to be a kind of a complaint that people aren't as connected on certain levels like they used to be, and they sometimes uh, attribute this to the technological uh, explosion that's going on, that people are connecting differently, but they're I connected. I, I don't like to generalize. I, yeah. I like to bring it... Yeah, I, I don't, and I don't think we should generalize about that. And, uh, you know, there are all the arguments about the pros and cons of technology and mm-hmm. whatever that's... whatever's arising from that. I think the focus is on on the individual and how they interpret what it means, and I think that's true. Obviously, this is true of any any significant word in somebody's vocabulary. I mean, uh, what is meant and to what to what depth, to what degree, and how relevant or meaningful is it? 
um, to them in their lives, right? And you don't have to address life this way. Mm-hmm. You can skim across the top of the water and get to the other side too. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, we can navigate the day without even considering, you know, what's important or what's not important about this or that. But um, I just find it uh, fascinating as to uh, what's below the surface. You know, mm. there's just so much. I, it makes me so optimistic. Yeah. You know, and I think if. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if I can generalize about that. About optimism or? No, just that, you know, that if, if you look below the surface, you'll, mm. you'll be optimistic. Right, right. Um, not necessarily <laughs> that's, so. Yeah. That's obviously, that would be <laughs> a big way. mistake. I'm not going to yeah. say that, you know, but, yeah. but um, I do find, well, certainly in the context of, of an institution and what I'm meant to do, you know, that's that's the way home. You know, that's mm. the that's the um, they've paid their ticket. Now I've got to deliver. So mm. I, and I think that that's what it is, actually. So. Mm. Um, you know, uh, back to the uh, the trees. Uh. <laughs> 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 and I still do this. It's like a yeah. ritual for me because uh, it's a, it's a meditative kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I I purposely want to notice if there are new leaves, if there are mm-hmm. you know. And I want to. I just I'm testing my own attentiveness mm-hmm. to what's in front of me and to what I see. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I don't want to take it for granted. And um, I'm I'm delighted hmm. that there are in fact new leaves on the left side. You know. Um, <laughs> on the third branch up. So, you know, Mm -hmm. and it sounds silly, but, you know, it's all available to us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a tree. It could be a person. It could be anything, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it better if they're living? I don't think it matters because I think it it really comes down to your lens again. Mm -hmm. If this is tuning up your lens, if this is informing you in a way that enables you to appreciate the world differently, Mm -hmm. And better than before, you may be disappointed, (laughs) but uh, you'll definitely be a little wiser. I, I, you know, and uh, so I think that's the opportunity and that's uh, gives purpose, Mm. you know, provides purpose. But this tree, and uh, it's the same for all of the things that we keep in our houses, uh, you know, it's in a pot. Um, it's alone. It's not connected underground to other trees, uh, but they also connect via the air. I mean, they uh, they dissipate certain things and uh, pheromones, what have you. Uh, sometimes I wonder if we should feel bad for these trees, <laughs> like we've taken them and kind of put them in a zoo. Uh, it's like what we do to you know lions and, uh, and and primates. We kind of take them and isolate them, and uh, they don't have feelings, but we feel for them. Uh, the idea that we're ever alone mm. is, um, you know, an imagined hmm. idea. So uh, one, one of the things I say in class, and, and maybe this be, may be by my own big foot, my own mouth, <laughs> my big mouth, but um, I say that you're never alone. Hmm. That this connect, connectedness, this being defined by and so on, relies on the fact that there is the other, that mm-hmm. there are things around us that we are connected to, and so on. And our absence makes a difference, mm-hmm. and our presence makes a difference. Passive or active mm-hmm. is not a, not a big issue. Mm-hmm. It's up to you, you know, but there it is. Yeah. So what, what would you like to do now? You know, kind mm. of thing. So... Um, yeah, who, who was it that said alienation was is the product of something about Marx? Is man made? Is man made? Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's uh, almost any living creature does not seem to do well on its own. Um, it always does better with others around it. Um, so it's interesting that we've kind of set our maybe more so in our Western world that we live in, uh, we've set our, uh, the way our processes are, are in place, the way our cultural practices are in place. It has a lot to do with 
individuality and honing the individual and uh, glorifying the individual and um, to such an extent that you'd have you'd have to say that maybe we've gone to a dysfunctional uh, degree of that uh, and it seems like there's a lot of people that are always trying to pull it back uh, and uh, bring this notion in that uh, you know what you just said that we rely on others to define ourselves but also to flourish right um, these are the kind of lessons that you're hoping to get across to students, or are they more aware of it? I mean, I'm getting the sense, and what I'm getting at is I'm getting the sense that these uh, younger people that I come across, they seem to be more aware of this than my generation was and the people this that were being, around me. Like the younger people that are in their uh, teenagers or 20s. Yeah. Uh, um, it's like they've, I mean, I guess you can't help it, to, but have a little bit of a head start. The culture is kind of presented... Uh, whatever the pioneers were talking about, and it's become eventually uh, more mainstream. And then the people born into the the existing culture then kind of have a different force structure in which they're uh, they're building their culture, and they seem to have a kind of a head start in certain things. Um, so that gives me optimism. Wow! Uh, no, I I don't agree. Okay, tell me why. And I'm pessimistic, actually. Mm. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I'm sympathetic um, when it comes to young people and what they're having to address because there's more of it. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily, um, you know, advantageous uh, to know about all of this, mm. right? Mm-hmm. But there is more of it because you have, you know, you're just being inundated. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, so that's that's uh, that part. Um, the activities, um, are troublesome, I think. What do you mean the activities? What? Well, because it's t- many of the uh, many of the activities in, involved these days with. You know, uh, your phone or whatever, mm. um, and I don't, I'm, I don't demonize these things. It's just, yeah. uh, it is what it is. Um, but the these activities take time. So, what is the activity exactly? You know, and what is it uh, delivering for the person? Um, in many cases, it's uh, basically a, uh, you know, a, a network. Uh, that is fueled by other people's insights, and they just circulate mm. like the blood in our <laughs> in our systems. You know, I mean, yeah. it just circulates to what end? I'm not exactly sure. Mm. So, retweeting or, or whatever it might be is, um, geez, I, I, you know, I can't imagine what the figures are in terms of recirculated material. Oh, right, yeah. Right, and mm-hmm. and so we become, you know, we become the people who just pass the, this baton. Right? Mm. And um, and I, I can understand the, you know, the broader uh, uh, opportunity, but that activity, you know, in a, say, a, a large portion of your waking hours, mm. um, uh, just seems to be draining, I think. You think? Opportunities yeah. to do other things. And that opportunity might be just to sit uh, alone looking out a window. Hmm. And there's there's uh, something by the name of Manoush Zamrodi who did a, a thing called Bored and Brilliant hmm. where uh, she actually uh, noticed people in their phones, their attachment to the phones and so on. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, and her point was, uh, that, uh, it was, it was removing time from, uh, those bored moments mm-hmm. where, um, you could do something else. Right. And we tend to, if we get bored, the first thing we'll do is pick up our phone because it will satisfy us mm-hmm. and, and use that time up. So, but but the reason I think uh, that we're we're drawn to that and and quickly you know in finding a moment of of silence that we we pull up our smartphones and and look through, but it, it's belying something about us in that we're seeking connection. Again, we're talking about connecting, connecting to others. I mean, it's not the phone we're connecting to, right? I've, it's I've, connecting to someone on the other end. Or I have no doubt there's a need to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I go back to, so what are we talking about when we say connected, right? And mm -hmm. to, to what degree? And um, what is the experience exactly, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing really, you're, you're mediated no matter what mm -hmm. uh, on this path. Um, and maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing. I'm not sure. Mm. At this point, all I know is it takes up a lot of time. It removes time from uh, opportunities to do other things. Right. And I guess part of the reason for that is that a lot of people are actually terrified to be alone with their thoughts. Um, I, I'm going to guess probably most people feel uncomfortable. Uh, maybe not the people that we, we travel around in circles. I mean, because we, we make a point of talking about, you know, what's swirling around inside of us. But a lot of people, I mean, uh, you see them all day long that they're very uncomfortable when you get there. I guess I'm not, I'm not sure. I, you know, I bumped into a couple, a couple, young couple who mm. both meditate mm. and they absolutely love it. Mm. And, uh, so I was, I was having a discussion with, uh, um, uh, this, one guy, and he said basically that uh, what was fundamentally um, beneficial for him was the opportunity to reflect. Mm. That's it, <clears throat> right? Yeah. So that opportunity to be outside of oneself, in a sense, right? And just notice, simplify, organize, or just plain let go, hmm. right? And, um, Those are two very different things, though, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, my point being that that takes time. Mm -hmm. There's no phone, <laughs> yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And there's no need for the phone in that moment. The phone is that app on my iPhone that I never use? Is that is that what you mean? The, the phone? The phone, yeah. Is the app on your... <laughs> on yeah, the iPhone. Yeah, whatever. No, it's that... Because there are people that never use that app on the iPhone. <laughs> what app? The phone. Oh, the phone. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. so, you know, there, it's interesting and it, and it was interesting to me that they even looked at that. Right? Mm. So I assume there are a lot of people who are like them, who need to, uh, somehow supplement their lives mm -hmm. and integrate something into their time that is simply, you know, reflecting. Mm. And I think that's the. That is the healthy part right there. So, mm. um, yeah, and, you know, they, were, they just had so many stories about, you know, how this was helpful for them. And I was just so hmm. glad, actually. And examined life, in a sense. Yeah, and, you know, all they're trying to do is take this, um, you know, abundance of incoming. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're trying to deal with it, you know, in a, in a healthy way. And as it turns out, it, it means sitting down and doing nothing. Hmm. Well, focusing on doing nothing, you know. Right. Well, you know, um, so you teach young people, but you're also a father of two children. So in a way, you, you've kind of got a, a design project that's 24 hours a day. <laughs> I mean, are, are you trying to, I mean, I don't know, what's your parenting approach in a sense? Are you trying to... It's the same as my yeah. teaching approach, yeah. stay out of the way, right? in a sense. I mean, it, you, you want to uh, keep them from harm, mm -hmm. um, but you want to give them a, you know, a six-lane highway, not mm -hmm. a narrow alley to go mm -hmm. down, and they can choose which lane to take. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the analogy, but <laughs> my, cool. my point is, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, and they, they've had, you know, in, uh, I, I think they've had uh, unique experiences. Uh, they've been confronted with things that uh, I would have a lot of difficulty with and they've mm -hmm. overcome them mm -hmm. and they're in the process of doing that as well. Um, and, um, you know, it's funny, and, and, and parents ask me, you know, how did you, you know, how did you do that? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I just drove them to where they wanted to go. <laughs> Stayed out of the way. <laughs> yeah, now, at the same time, I mean, you, you, that is the understanding, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, uh, and, uh, and they understand. Mm-hmm. 
but clearly what, what you're describing is kind of the the intellectual layer but obviously there's a fundamental uh, more fundamental layer in which you're giving them safety and security and love that they're uh, going to build everything else on and it seems like um, I mean I don't have children but um, I think I might someday and uh, it, it seems to me that um, yeah you kind of get out of the way but you have to give them the firmament uh, it seems to me, if I'm if I'm right about this, that they're going to feel comfortable enough to discover. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I think most, you know, most of the parents that I know, anyway, are mm -hmm. are very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the you know, but the the world is not mm -hmm. you know, and so. Um, you, you kind of have to um, just be conscious of the fact that, you know, number one, uh, there is no school for parenting, so there's no, there's no right way. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, um, they intuitively uh, are capable of much more than you think, mm -hmm. than you imagine. I, th I think we, you know, I mean, we... we how do we look at children? You know, mm -hmm. they are, you know, they're born kind of mindless and mm. so on, you know. <laughs> uh, but they're equipped like crazy, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, they're lacking language and knowledge. But they have all kinds of intuitive skills oh, yeah. and so on. And so, you know, you start educating them with language and knowledge and it becomes apparent that, oh, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I th I think maybe my choice at the beginning of this was to accept that in the first place, that, mm. that it's all there. All right. um, it's whether or not uh, they're going to connect in the mm. way we've been talking, but connect in a way that uh, is relevant and meaningful mm. for them. Right. You know. Once, and, sorry. And so, what about uh, how how is all of this informed by your childhood and and your parents' uh, their approach to you? Is there kind of by example or counterexample? Is it uh, well? They were obviously under very different uh, circumstances in which to. Well, to our deal advantage with. is you and I are the same uh, mm -hmm. of the age that mm -hmm. uh, we can compare um, access today mm -hmm. to access or inaccessibility mm. before, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I think the advantage that they have is, is um, that access to, well, being exposed to all kinds of things and um, being able to make choices about those things. Now, that's also, you know, a really difficult task, right? Uh, but uh, as it turns out, from what I've observed, it's a very it can be a very natural thing if you enable it mm -hmm. and just let it, you know, leave it alone. And uh, the truth is, we love to do th what we love to do. Mm -hmm. So apparently, they found a couple of things that they love, and uh, that has helped to inform and provide structure and lessons and mm -hmm. contact and I, I'm very grateful I'm so grateful of it, that that access is there for them mm -hmm. whereas for me you know I had to ne negotiate with my parents to go to the mall or something you know that was about that was the extent of my world <laughs> whereas you know mm. as, as you know my daughter you know you know goes to Azerbaijan or something you know uh All right. uh my God, I mean, it's just a completely different hmm. concept and possibility, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it seems our parents and uh, are of the generation that they've gone through some shit, you know? And uh, and, and it's... Um, I hear a lot of people talk about, uh, people my age, about how their parents screwed them up or something, you know? But it's, it's really hard to blame somebody, uh, having gone through the things that they have. And some of them have gone through wars and yeah. uh, concentration camps and, you know, et cetera. And uh, that's a whole different thing you're dealing with, right? I mean, it's... Uh, well, I think the pendulum was... So, you know, after the war was over, the pendulum swung 
toward security and safety, mm-hmm. obviously, and some yeah. sense of being grounded in a place that you know is reasonable for the life of a family. So mm-hmm. that's it. That was the yeah. age, right? Mm-hmm. And everything was built around that. Everything was designed around that. The suburbs are designed around that idea, and in, and it worked, right? I think the disadvantage of that construction, though, is that the world uh, on the larger scale is not actually like that. You know, Mm. it is, um, it can be unsafe. It can be uncertain and so on. And so, you know, I think uh, being equipped and prepared for that um, is an important thing, Mm -hmm. which is you know, a different, a different agenda for, for me as a parent relative to uh, uh, my own parents, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you touched upon something that I guess I would call worry and uh, uh, worry about the future. And uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of, I guess, therapeutic practices in play which try to teach you to be more in the moment uh, and in a sense not uh, be in the future or in the past. Uh, it seems like if you're in the past a lot, you're kind of susceptible to depression. And if you're constantly worried about the future, you're, you're susceptible to anxiety. But it's one of those features of, of human uh, proclivities that have served us well in that the reason that we tended to do well uh, compared to other species is that we had foresight. And we could plan ahead and say, oh, this is going to happen, you know, when the moon is uh, full again, so we'll do this. And uh, as a result, worrying about what might happen and planning for it is is what got us to a lot of places that we did. But if you apply that to to everything and in every experience of your life, it becomes problematic because you're not, as they say, living in the moment. How how do you feel about that whole uh, present, past, future, (laughs) you know, experiencing your life? In moments, I don't know. I, you know what, I, 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 I don't know if I use the phrase in the moment. Yeah. Uh, I think I, you know the word I use more more often is uh, experience your mm. uh, your your actual experience and the feeling of it, the action or inaction, the. And so on. I prefer to go straight to the content, I suppose, of what you're describing, mm. rather than to uh, and and go into the detail of that. And mm. and and in teaching, I try to uh, somehow uh, bring that to life, bring these elements to bear mm-hmm. uh, in a in a process, an exercise, or or whatever. So rather than talk about embodiment and Mm. You know, things like that. Um, it would be an experience that that is different from, you know, most experiences. Mm. And then the whole exercise of sort of deconstructing that or, or you know, I, I suppose being a reductionist and, and so on. But, um, yeah, and, and I, I think that's the opportunity. Uh, I think there's a whole dialogue that happens that's more about the dialogue than the thing itself, right? In the Somewhere. moment is, yeah. is, is a dialogue, right, mm-hmm. in my view, okay. right? Whereas, you know, okay, so how do I feel? Mm-hmm. Or what, what did you say? What am I hearing? How am I meaning it? What, you know, being in the verb, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as opposed to objectifying. Right you know, all of this mm-hmm. uh, event material things and so on, right? Yeah, this this uh, this is kind of a, a, an evolution in, in, in philosophy in the sense that there's always, uh, and science, uh, this notion that we were looking at uh, discrete objects, I mean, you touched upon it in quantum mechanics, and then you find that uh, there aren't uh, such things in the world necessarily, and that, uh, I mean, a lot of things are processes rather than things. Mm-hmm. And one of the, to me, one of the most interesting examples of that is uh, the self. It's not really a thing. I mean, you can't really point to it and say, oh, this is what identifies uh, Robin or or Jake. It's a whole series of processes and and, uh, movements and uh, uh, storms that are going on within you. And then we're kind of pulling it all together somehow within this this body that uh, we call uh, Robin. And uh, that we identify that as you, 
but it's not something that's there to point at. And that's kind of troubling for a lot of us because it's the most, the thing that's most familiar to us is ourselves in a way. And we find that when we peel it back, there's really not a core there other than what you're doing. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, I don't know, again, you know, rather than bring up the, um, the concept of self mm. and, you know, the, the possibilities there. Um, I would aim at the core. What's the core? Like, what, what are we talking about? Like, is, are we just talk, using core as we would use self? Mm. You know, so it's just a different placeholder for something that we're actually trying to say, that we mm. need to say, right? So it could be, you know, what, what do you need mm. right now? You know, mm-hmm. um, or what is your truth? You know, mm-hmm. these types of things. Let's you know, get get to the get to what it. Mm-hmm. Oh God, I can't well, even. I can't even. You know, our <laughs> well, language it's, doesn't it's permit ineffable. us to. Yeah, yeah. You, you, so you know, every every word's an objectification of something, <laughs> right? right? So so. You, yeah, so and I go back to experience, right? Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, exper- the experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that can be, you know, uh, that could be anything, mm-hmm. which, I, which I think is, you know, fascinating in itself um, and highly underrated. Mm. You know, our attention is not on that. Our attention is on, uh, uh, I don't know. It seems to me a lot of externalities. Right? Mm-hmm. You mentioned core. Is it a core of the self you're talking about? A core? I don't really know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe core is is yeah. uh, the most relevant thing in, at, mm-hmm. at, at the time. I mean, like at, right. at the, yeah, in the moment, right? I, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But relevance. You know, what's important? Like what? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and who cares? Why I care? I mean, things like that. I mean. Um, I think, uh, like some of these things, obviously, you know, this is endless. I mean, there's an infinite ways mm-hmm. it can go. It, it, um, you know, uh, you could do a PhD on this stuff, mm-hmm. whatever. For the purposes of, of, uh, students in second year, um, I think the important thing is to know that there is a, discussion to be had Hmm. you don't have to know the answer right you don't have to know um where Mm -hmm. you're going and and so on and so forth you just have to know that this is an important discussion and it's it's um and it's worthy of Mm -hmm. discussion right Mm -hmm. and um and you'll find out you know in, in time so um as opposed to you know this is the self, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, mind, body or something like that. Mm-hmm. Thank you for screwing up my entire life with that concept, <laughs> right? Thanks, Plato. <laughs> exactly. And Descartes and so on. I mean, yeah. thanks a lot, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, do but we've spent a century we on doing dual- that. Yeah. <laughs> we got, that's why we have two pockets in our <laughs> right. pants for all the dualisms that exist, right? <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah. And, and you know, so, you know. Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's necessary for, in order to address the needs of, Mm. of, you know, the young people I'm teaching anyway. Yeah. It's another example of, uh, you know, pigeonholing things into discrete parts so that we can understand it so that we can communicate about it. But then we tend to take that for reality rather than the way that we're actually trying to communicate. Yeah. Representation, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and objectification, all those things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, and imagery, you know, Baudrillard, mm-hmm. Baudrillard and, yeah. and so on. You know, I mean, it's uh, it, it's sad because we bought it hook, line, and singer. Oh, yeah. we, we are following instructions. Mm-hmm. Well, right? metaphors are very seductive uh, yeah. when they tend to, you know, explain <laughs> by giving you some kind of a superstructure of how things. Oh, yeah. you, you give a metaphor. Well, that's how the world works. And then you kind of make sure it fits within that metaphor, even if it doesn't. I mean, we yeah. have this dual nature of ourselves and everything else in order to fit that, we have to kind of work hard at that. 
Well, I think I think one of the unfortunate things is that we we place a lot of emphasis on uh, the cognitive mm-hmm. and not enough on on emotion and body and oh, and, tell me about it, right? I, yeah. So, and, that, and that's another thing that uh, I I think is important to sort of. And I make this point at the, at the beginning, literally this way. You know, this about sort of reattaching the head to the body kind of thing and. Mm-hmm. And and sort of dispens- I don't bring it up, but dispensing mm-hmm. with mind body kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, right, once right. and for all, mm-hmm. and then, you know, here are some exercises. Let's explore. Yeah. Let's see, let's see what we come up with, mm-hmm. right? And um, uh, I do a thing on noticing where, you know, it's great. Uh, there's there's a writer by the name of Klingenborn, mm-hmm. who 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 actually has a bit of a rant about um, the authority of noticing that mm. we've it's been taken away from us in a sense right and and for students in particular um, and uh, one of the things I'd address is you know so let's let's take back that authority that mm. let's let's take anything you notice and not treat it as trivial or or or, or in any way less than okay uh, let's see where we can get with that you know. Mm. And uh, and it's an interesting process because they they really do um, they try you know I mean there's effort and focus I'm trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about you know hmm. yeah yeah so and it's pretty interesting what are, what arises from that sometimes um, yeah what you just touched upon uh, this this duality um, now. What duality? Well, I mean, this this sense that we think about the mind, and, well, the duality I'm most concerned with, the yeah. intellect versus the emotions, for oh, example. It. No, and it's it's yeah. a it's not a it's not even a duality where mm-hmm. it, it's a format. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Life work balance. Mm-hmm. We just ran into that, right? Life work balance. Well, what the? Like, where the heck did that come from? Mm. Right. It seems like if you can if you can reduce something to its most meaningless shape <laughs> hmm. uh, then it it's true it's real it's but it's that's the only substance. way sometimes to get it across and communicate it is to really simplify it to hone it down like the, to, to uh, soften the edges of it to uh, define it but in a way by defining it you're removing well, what, what further if, from what that. if we were able to yeah. you know in all of the conversations on the planet mm-hmm. <laughs> Just remove the layer of describing things. Hmm. Right. So we're no longer describing anything. It's no longer a representation of a representation. Right? You're talking it's about the experience? It's strictly or? the raw language. Hmm. Right? Sounds so let's, let's uh, you and I just get um, on the same page on the word meaningful. Hmm. Something like that, right? Hmm. Um, or, you know, to care. Mm-hmm. Right? Something like that. I don't know. Like the well, theory- they're, they're always going to be ill-defined. I mean, that's, that's the nature of language. I mean, despite what we tell ourselves and, and these grammarians, and we think that there's a rational but, structure but to what it. what I'm talking yeah. about, when you, when you do that, it becomes an investigation, hmm. right? It's an inquiry. Into it's the not, meaning? It's not an ex- just a out and out accepted hmm. format or idea mm-hmm. life work balance is a you know is a piece of concrete mm-hmm. for a lot of people right yeah that, that that that's how much meaning it has uh something to live by an mm-hmm. entire life by and so so on uh <clears throat> and it's not clear you know mm-hmm. where that goes for for individuals who are very different from each other how do you deal with this life work balance? Uh, for Very me, it badly. was yeah, it was just removing work. <laughs> that was the way to do it. I, you know, I, I get I get, whenever I hear the word balance, I get mm. really, <laughs> really messed up. I I, I just mm. uh, it's not a favorite of mine mm. because uh, you know equilibrium. Mm-hmm. You know, it just doesn't fit for me. I, I just, I, for me personally, but yeah. my view of the world, you know, right. why would you demand 
equilibrium mm. of the world, you know. Well, we seem to see many examples of it around, or what yeah. we what we interpret as equilibrium. I mean, you see forces of nature, you see things moving within, uh, you know, biology that it tends to find some kind of a, you know, uh, what we call balance. Mm. But we only call it balance because that's the most adapted uh, level at which it works for us. And we say, well, it's balanced because it's a little bit more and it would be too much and a little bit less, it'd be too little. But the balance is only is only played out after the fact that it, that it works for us. It's kind of hard to predict what that's going to be in, in almost anything until well, yeah, and you're you talking play about it in. You're talking about causally, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it's mm-hmm. a causal thing, mm-hmm. uh, which is, uh, you know, a secure kind of way of going, right? Mm-hmm. But you and I know a better description would be the blur. Yeah. It's all a blur. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, you know, mm. that's unsettling. But of mm. course it's unsettling. <laughs> that's right. You know, it's difficult, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's a blur. No, 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 it's a straight line. I'm going to get my environmental design degree and then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you've hit upon something here that I think is, is, is what I've been talking a lot about lately is that, and you kind of see it played out within even the current politics, is that this very uh, fear of the blur in a sense that people... A lot of people are uncomfortable with that, and a lot of people uh, seek discrete answers. And one of the ways that it's provided to them is to find a, an embodied political figure who will give them all the answers and say, oh, well, this is how you fix it, and this is how we're going to do it. And everyone says, oh, at least he's got an answer. <laughs> you know, even if deep down they know it's probably bullshit, it's just <laughs> people just feel more comfortable. I refuse to talk about politics. <laughs> it's not politics. It's, it's uh, about humans and how they deal no, with no, complexity. Get, and how you they and I will get angry. <laughs> And because you're a Trump supporter, and, uh, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we'll be unhappy for another day. Mm. Uh, I rarely get into those kind of political uh, conversations. I, I don't get into debates because I can't really completely justify, uh, you know, my position in a lot of things. But I do like to talk about how politics works and how the people react to mass movements and how uh, maybe a culture as a whole or even a species as a whole is is uh, is reacting to developments and complexities within the world. And, and one of the ways in which uh, metaphors in which you can view this is that, uh, and it seems to be kind of... Um, uh, not disputed that the technological curve is, is, is ramping up a little bit faster, so it seems to us, and, and whether or not it is uh, is not relevant, it's the experience of it, is that people are feeling somewhat overwhelmed, and uh, the threshold for a lot of people have been reached, and uh, it's getting there for, for me as well. Sometimes you just feel overwhelmed, and you think, oh, this is just too much, I'm just going to run away and uh, live in a shack somewhere, you know, like the, like the Unabomber, maybe. Answer, <laughs> but without the explosions. Yeah. My answer to that is... Uh It'll be fine. Yeah, I tend to think that too. But, you know. No, I, yeah. it's interesting because uh, Ursula Franklin refers to uh, t- uh, technology as the way we do things around here. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And this would be, you know, obviously pre digital and, yeah. and so on, uh, her use of the word. And, you know, I, I kind of love it, you know, because um, I feel like I can be involved in that. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. The way I do things around here is mm-hmm. my technology. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, so I, I, have, I have choices I can make and, and so on, right? Technology, you know, the word is, as it's used now yeah. is all things digital and, and you know, uh, Moore's Law. And, right. It refers and so to on. machines and things, but that's not what it is. Technology yeah, and it, is, it will go yeah. where it's going. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, that's the best you can say and that's mm-hmm. all you can say. Uh, and it's it, yes, it will go uh, relatively speaking quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we've talked about this before. I mean, you know, I think the more important thing will be the choices. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so are we equipped to make uh, the right choices? Uh, that's that's historically that's, no. That's a big, <laughs> well, you know, uh, and I just mean on the mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the practice of everyday life level, you mm. know. Um, and I, so that, you know, you can uh, be, you know, at least satisfied mm-hmm. or, or accountable, you know, right. one or the other. And um, not that, that either of those necessarily leads to contentment or anything, mm. but um, at least, you know, this sounds... Uh, more in in my control, you know, to some extent, so that I can I can play a part. 
Mm -hmm. Technology, as it's described, is completely separate from any control that mm -hmm. any of us have. And we're, we're behaving in ways that, um, uh, you know, uh, are mannered hmm. and designed to you be that way, you know. Kind of like a Heideggerian in the sense that, uh, yeah, you can view technology as, as kind of a, an emergent um, entity in itself that's... Uh, moving forward, changing and adapting and surviving. And, uh, yeah. and it has really no regard for the human. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a tool for us. It's uh, something that has its own, I don't know if it's telos or purpose or anything, but it has its own life. Well, I guess the thing I'm pointing at is uh, something uh, this guy, Jason De Silva, has pointed out, and others have McLuhan mm -hmm. and, and many others, uh, but it, it, the way he puts it is, design is designing us back. It designs us back. Does, what do you mean? Designs? Design designs us back. In other okay. words, we, we create something, but the impact of that, whatever that creation is, uh, yields um, uh, behavior uh, and all kinds of, uh, perhaps, you know, affects relationships and all kinds of things in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, we may not know, right? But uh, the point is there is an impact on us. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, Jobs did what he wanted to do. He wanted to, you know, poke at reality. Well, you know, hmm. here we are. You yeah. know, we're, we're, we're in this different uh, sort of reality. So we're behaving in it as a result, Mm -hmm. Right, so designs designs us back, and this was true. This is true of building, of space, uh, of anything. You know, it's nobody's fault. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it works, right? So, I guess the thing I'm watchful of. There's somebody by the Sherry Turkle who, uh, I think she's at MIT, and she makes a big point about this, right? Mm -hmm. That in her own way, but essentially what she's talking about is the same thing, you mm -hmm. know. And she's noticing things that are kind of um, not encouraging about how technology is uh, disrupting uh, conversation, dialogue, right. relationship, and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, techno I mean, we talked, uh, I mean, last night we went to an event and uh, mm -hmm. there were people talking at great length about uh, <laughs> this uh, technological um, things on the horizon that will allow us to, for example, extend life. Yeah. And that's going to have a great deal of impact on yeah. the way we organize ourselves. Yeah. And uh, almost any technology has an impact like that. But some of the ones that seem to be around the corner are really uh, disruptive technologies, uh, you know, because it impacts our entire lives in, in a more fundamental sense in that it would be extended possibly that, uh, you could replace body parts. You could, um, and then we go on to things like virtual reality, uh, that's getting really good these days in, in that we'll be able to very soon. And, and some people are already doing it, you know, go into virtual worlds and distinguish that less and less from our so-called, uh, everyday reality world. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, maybe 20 years from now you're going to have completely different uh, social and cultural norms in which people will be you know you know some people complain about video games <clears throat> taking up too much of your time well could you imagine a completely immersive reality in which you can be and you're wearing these uh, haptic suits that are you know uh, you're feeling the viscerally some of the things that you're seeing uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna think that there's going to be a situation where a lot of people are going to stay a long time within those realities because they're going to be designed the way they want it to be. And uh, what's that going to do? I mean, that's going to clearly change a lot of things. Well, again, I, you know, I mean, my, you know, my, my concern is not so much the degree of technology or the mm -hmm. impact of the technology and so on. It's, uh, for me, it's still whether or not you enter uh, the world of that, mm -hmm. uh, ignorant mm -hmm. or aware, and you choose from there, right? Now, we're literally, you know, behaving in ways that I think may prove to be kind of ignorant, actually, no from doubt. an ignorant position. Yeah. So we're, we're actually doing things that are uh, maybe um, disadvantageous, right? So you've, you've got 
about, uh, I think it's Lanya who talks about um, personhood. Mm. And uh, there's a book, I can't remember the book. You Are Not a Gadget is the name mm. of the book. I love the title. <laughs> you Are Not a Gadget, Jason Lanyard. Uh, uh, Lanyard, sorry. And he, um, he basically makes a request you know, and he's he's embedded in the world of technology. He's responsible for a lot of it, and so on. And then his 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 request comes down to the next time you tweet something or retweet something, stop for a minute and put yourself into that somehow. Like mm. make it yours somehow, and then deliver. Right? Hmm. Don't just pass it on, a kind of unthinkingly. Right? Right. Um, because his, his point is that, you know, we're, we're doing this without any ownership, without any real position, right? Hmm. It's, it's just like a mechanical behavior. It's so fleeting, transient, you know, yeah. and disposable. It's almost that, like that the, it has, the technological processes are kind of behaving themselves ra- through us rather well, than... Well, you know, yeah. it's still level scratching an itch. It's hmm. not, you know... Uh, I really, uh, you know, the moment I read Personhood, I knew exactly what he was talking about. I mean, mm. so it's not about, you know, the technology, but how you use it, whether you, you're aware of what you're participating in and how you're participating in it and so on. And, you know, the level of awareness across the population of the world mm. It ain't ever going to get there, right? but you, let's no. face it. But, you know, I'm dreaming, you know. Yeah. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, good, a really good point, and uh, I'm certainly going to be spreading that around, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, you know, and I, I find myself, you know, with a lot of the uh, new platforms and so on, I don't know how to participate um, other than the way that they're... Um, they've designed to participate. I mean, we we know other people who can take any app and make it do what they want it to do mm-hmm. kind of thing. They can really manipulate it um, and make it much more worthwhile and engaging and all mm-hmm. this sort of stuff. I mean, when it comes to even emails, you know, uh, there was a point uh, when I uh, I was on an airplane <laughs> And I heard some people behind me just just cursing emails because they, they felt they were so impersonal. Really, it was well, the impersonality of it that it's just a, it's them? just yeah. it's just a vehicle. You're mm. the one who's being impersonal. Yeah, right. So mm-hmm. I, I, you know, so I, when I got back, I decided I would write. I'd really think about the email that came in, the mm. request or the, the topic or the mm. person, and whatever yeah. struck me, I, I would first respond. Yeah. To, to whatever the request was. But whatever struck me, I would elaborate on. Right? Mm. And I'd do a, like a, an extra paragraph or something. And, and I, I remember somebody brought up, in a, there was a group of us, and somebody brought up, I love Robert's emails. I never want to know what I'm going to get. You know, it's like a <laughs> box of chocolates kind of thing. But I mean, the point was, I just wanted to be there, mm. like be, be in it. I didn't, in those moments, I, and those with those people, mm-hmm. I wanted to be... Uh, more of a person and less of a message. Is that for your benefit or theirs or both? both? Yeah, both. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's just make it keep it a dialogue as opposed to mm-hmm. um, you know just a switching device in a sense, mm-hmm. right? So um, hmm. you know, and just go for it. Like it was interesting what happened. I mean, it was sort of like uh, you you end up getting a, a bit of a following, you know, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> On something, you know, and it was, I don't know, it was very interesting. Robin's ways. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, again, I mean, it's just, uh, hmm. I, I think I was saying before, um, you know, I, I, I'm an artist at heart, so, mm-hmm. you know, notice, noticing is not only part of a course for me, it's something pretty important uh, uh, it's just a way of, of being kind of thing mm. and uh, it's it's uh, great in some circumstances and uh, it's part of my big world of distractions as well mm. so it can be a difficulty yeah but, uh, um, 
we talked about the world being maybe uh, too much aligned with the intellect as opposed to the body, but I, I'm sensing that we might be swinging back the other way. And that might be a little bit disconcerting. And this is what we tend to do. We tend to go too far in one extreme and then we go too far in the other extreme. And we are in... And it seems like we've gone past the center and back towards uh, reliance, um, uh, not to, to talk about politics directly, but in the sense that you see people uh, being, uh, for lack of a better word, seduced by uh, emotional uh, arguments, in a sense, without, um, without reason. Uh, and people are willing to accept that. And I think that's dangerous, too. I mean, that, uh, see, to, to draw a parallel to my personal uh, evolution and development, uh, I grew up being very much on the intellectual uh, side of things and, and viewing the world and processing uh, my experiences that way. It's been very helpful to me over the last several years to discover, realize, understand, and learn to deal with the other sides. I, I know these are metaphors. It's not like it's split into two. You have like an intellect and emotions, but those other processes at play have been useful. Uh, but I can see that if you, and perhaps I've even experienced it in my own personal experience, you go too far down that path and you go a little nuts. And uh, it's kind of hard to engage with the world again if you uh, go too far down that path. Uh, and you see, you know, there's no shortage of historical uh, events and processes where you see a, um, a strong man come on the scene and, and give emotional responses to everything uh, and say, here are the answers, this is what we need to do. And everyone says, oh, great, you know, this is, uh, this is easy because I don't really have to think about it. And uh, I, it's almost like, uh, you know, I've seen this happen personally in my life. But uh, I'm seeing it writ large in the world, and it almost seems like maybe, hey, we need to go back a little bit more towards the intellect in the sense that let's, uh, of course, pay attention to our emotional, visceral uh, responses, but also you have to, I mean, in order for us to, to, to have success, it seems that you have to kind of... Um, uh, accept that the intellect is still going to 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 guide it to make decisions every now and then. You can't just you know ditch it and 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 be suspicious of it. So maybe I'm having a podcast now as opposed to doing music that I've been doing the last couple of years uh, because it's kind of drawing me more back to the intellectual analytic way of 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 looking and talking and thinking about the world. But what I'm hoping is that because I've gone down that path of trying to understand the the emotional side of it, I have maybe a better balance for lack of a better word to understand that so I, i'm seeing the world uh is requiring this as well or at least the, the world in which i live in where what i see on in in uh, popular culture that's uh, that's reflected in the politics for example uh maybe there's more room for intellect and uh understanding rather than reacting and understanding viscerally yeah well what, mm. i guess what i'm wanting to hear about what you just said mm. <laughs> is that uh, there are different kinds of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, the world of, you know, objective mm -hmm. ideas and concepts and all that stuff, uh, you're never going to get done. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then as to truths that may be embedded in that, good luck. Yeah. Um, and... The same thing exists on uh, on the side of knowledge of self. I think mm -hmm. you know it's just it's infinite. But I think it'll be just. Yeah, I just think it's more fruitful mm -hmm. um, because again, it, it prepares you uh, in a way that uh, you know you'll engage differently, mm -hmm. or you'll engage the same way, but for better reason. That's mm -hmm. it. I mean, that's it. I mean, I and and. You know, who knows what happens? Like mm -hmm. you said, you said earlier. You know, these these people are doing th uh, uh, following so and so for no reason or something. No, there's mm -hmm. a reason. Mm -hmm. It just might be done, mm -hmm. <laughs> or there's it might be it might be you know oversimplified. Mm -hmm. right. It might be inaccurate. It mm -hmm. might be wrong, mm -hmm. right? Uh, by whoever standards. Um, well, there's just a reason. So, how do we how do we improve the quality of the reason? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and and but there are uh, disincentives in place to to focus on such things. It's, uh, I mean, our consumer society is 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 such that people are honed over their experiences uh, and engagement with popular culture to become less 
uh, analytic and questioning and more responsive and reactive. And, and that works really well if you're trying to sell something to somebody, uh, oh be it God. a product so you're, or... You're, uh, you're bringing up a, <laughs> a topic. I think, I think what we, uh, much like farm animals, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, we have been uh, trained in transactional behavior. Mm-hmm. The exchange of value. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, somebody throws something in the trough (laughs) and we just go running for it. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, behaviorism, (laughs) right? But it's transactional. And, okay, so so there's that, right? Mm -hmm. I I don't even, you know. And then that has sort of doubled down in a sense because we've appropriated or... How shall I say? We, we, we just, by, by, you know, mitosis, mm. <laughs> you know, we've taken, um, you know, that transactional behavior and applied it to absolutely everything oh, else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Instrumentalist approach to everything. Yeah. And uh, if you think about, uh, say, take that and think about relationship. Mm-hmm. If relationship is about exchange of value and can be hmm. you can you can rationalize relationships yeah. that way it's one way to look at it yeah but you know what it it won't add up mm-hmm. <laughs> right. it just won't add up because you can't evaluate some of those things mm-hmm. in terms of value and benefit well you can but i mean that's you know depends on your ego depends on your mm. personality and we that's what we do though we just do that that's our mm. way you know everything's transactional so that you know uh, we're just oblivious, I think. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I mean, you just the the alternative, you know, is to begin maybe. And one of the alternatives is relational, mm-hmm. you know, and that is, you know, thinking about, you know, shared interest. Yeah. Um, first, right. And if nobody's interested, don't do it. Right. But mm. you know. But think about shared interest first. Um, that's a different way to go. And as it turns out, you know, shared interest is another way of saying community, coincidentally. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> if you start there, it doesn't mean you have to throw out uh, the economics of that circumstance. You don't have to throw out, uh, you know, the financial strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It's just starting at a different place. Yeah, which um, alleviates that myopic, transactional Mm -hmm. kind of perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's still in there. Yeah, you know, Uh, you know what? This goes back to um, Polanyi, Carl Polanyi, uh, the Mm. Great Transformation book, like written in the like I think nineteen forty four or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he basically said that, um, you know, he noticed that uh, his, his view was that there was a time that uh, uh, economics was an adjunct mm-hmm. to society. Hmm. So, so, society essentially, you know, if you want to visualize it, the big circle yeah. and the smaller circle attached to that or inside that is, hmm. is economics, right? And what he saw was that we've basically flipped that around. Mm. That economics, that society is the adjunct to economics, right? And you have because everything is defined within those uh, even the yeah, construct. even our vernacular, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, sure. We talk about the consumer. That's not the. That's not our. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not people language. That's no. that's <laughs> economics. It's marketing language. Marketing, right? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. over there. How to oh. get over here? You know. <laughs> yeah. So I think you know, and we talk about it. It's it's really you know. Uh, kind of strange now and I um, you know it's interesting looking at um, say First Nations cultures Mm -hmm. Aboriginal cultures all these and customs that are not uh, based on transaction you know Mm. uh, um, there's a big book called The The Gift Mm. by Lewis Hyde and he kind of he kind of presents. Uh, there's an aspect to the book that sort of presents the same case, mm-hmm. where you know 
uh, the blankets to the tribe. I, I don't know the detail. I can't remember the details. It's been a long time. But the uh, the blankets of the tribe obviously um, uh, indicate a level of authority if you have them. Mm -hmm. But they're not your blankets. You are you are basically there to uh, sort of take care of them. But they're everybody's blankets. Right. I'm not sure I understand the blanket. I, I, I'm immediately drawn well, to the these blank uh, disease uh, blankets it, that I were given it, to the no, think about, <laughs> to natives. Think about a, a tribe, right? Yeah. Uh, that treasures blankets. Okay. Yeah. As having uh, obviously some real value, mm. but some symbolic value. Right. And they are uh, representative of um, the community. Mm. And uh, but it's a shared thing. Mm. Um, I don't even want to use the word value because I don't, mm. I can't, I can't relate actually mm. entirely because I'm in transactional mode. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I had to use the word value. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's okay. That's but legitimate. I mean, I, there, we met every word as a metaphor and that's stolen from some other context as well. So it's just, uh, if you no, but I know as I'm saying yeah. it, I know mm. as I'm saying it, that I'm in yeah. transaction. Mode. Like I, I, right. you know, it's I'm, I'm because I'm, you know, in the, we're in the realm of exchange of value. I'm meaning it you know, yeah. that way because I can't mean yeah. it any other way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, we we gotta. It seems like we gotta figure out new ways of uh, of doing that uh, in terms of. Um, I mean, if you're seeing everything in a, in the transactional value like we are, and we're we're organizing our society and cultural practices in such a way that everything is you know, quantified and transacted and, and uh, judged according to, to value. And uh, we're going to find very soon um, a large percentage of the population that's not going to be necessary for those uh, transactional uh, manufacturing uh, things. So um, what are we going to do? I mean, it seems like yeah, I'm kind of worried about that. We're already doing it. It's just, yeah. we, it's not, you know, front and center. Um, you know, if you... I don't know how many volunteers are there in Canada hmm. doing anything but volunteering. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd really like to know. I bet you it's a huge number. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids are involved in things where there are lots of volunteers. I am always uh, amazed, and I leave those occasions really optimistic hmm. because I can't believe that all of these people are so committed to, to sharing their time Mm -hmm. And uh, to to further somebody else's cause, right? Mm -hmm. For the benefit, in this case, for the benefit of the children, right? Yeah. Um, but there are tons of examples of this. There's, I know that's just one version, yeah. but uh, it's going on. Yeah. yeah, but that's of course it's going on, and that's great, and it's going on when you have your your, your basic needs met, and then you have some bandwidth to to volunteer. Um, if there's a situation where most people are unemployed which is likely to happen in the next uh, 20 years because of automation and uh, you know efficiencies of processes that have been underway for a long time and continue to, to advance. Uh, we are in need of a new structuring of, of politics, of commerce. Uh, you know, how are these people going to... It's great, they'll volunteer, but how are they going to be fed? Are we going to have to have more government control, which is, you know, people are quite allergic to that well, idea. But everything you're talking yeah. about is, a, is an externality. Yeah, um, and every the ones you've mentioned are extremely slow moving, mm. and the the in terms of the um, uh, the philosophy behind whatever that new structure or new economy or whatever it might be, nobody has that model yet. No, and I'm afraid we're not like, going to find what, it. What yeah. does post capitalism look like? Yeah, right. Yeah, and and can I? Is there even such a thing anyway? Right. So yeah, this uh, is what I'm worried you know, about. I, I yeah. heard an interesting phrase. Uh, People can imagine the end of the world easier than they can imagine the end of capitalism. Sure, <laughs> that's true. Right, and I think yeah. I, I think we, we just we are not in a. I don't think we're in a place, and maybe technology will mm. will throw it in our face. Right, mm -hmm. and I suspect it. Well, it is. Yeah, it is doing it now. Yeah. It's undermining. Well, it's displacing labor it, for it, one. It, yeah, it, undermining is the wrong word. It, yeah. it is adjusting. Mm -hmm. Uh, economies and industries and so on. So, you know, it, it will become clearer and clearer, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book by uh, called The Seventh Sense, Sense mm -hmm. by a guy named Ramo, and he, that's what he talks about. He talks about how this distributed, although he refers to it as distributed 
power really mm. uh, is uh, uh, not in the hands of the authorities because they don't know what it is. Right. They, they're blind to, mm-hmm. to uh, I shouldn't say blind, but they're, they're just not up to date. They're not leading. They're not up to date yeah. and, and, and mm-hmm. leading, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, you better watch out. What so knows. what's leading these things? Is it kind of a unconscious cultural movements? Is it, uh, is it, you know, like, uh, what do you mean? these things? Well, I mean, you said it's not, uh, these changes of these, uh, um, developments aren't necessarily in the hands of leaders, uh, that are making conscious decisions of things. Uh, it seems like technology and money and, uh, cultural movements and, um, could be even natural disasters are going to shape the way we, uh, react and, and, and uh, learn to reorganize ourselves. But what tends to happen with, with humans is that we don't do it proactively. We, we often wait till the catastrophe happens, and then we try to pick up the pieces. And that's a really difficult way to do it. And the way that you're going to get around that is to be more uh, intellectual and analytic in advance, in a sense, more anxiety-ridden, more worrying about the future, which is something that we, we shy away from. But, you know, it's necessary. And, um, uh, these, you know, technological advancements, uh, that we're talking about are, are just on our doorstep to, to disrupt us. I mean, every generation says this, but I mean, it seems like there is an acceleration and, and I'm starting to, to buy into that. Uh, and we're never ready. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a challenge. I think it's irrelevant. What's irrelevant? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I, I think the rate of mm-hmm. change. Really? Yeah. But if it's moving faster, that you just don't simply have enough time to solidify or bring in new cultural practices that take take hold. It's just uh, we're constantly in reaction to the next change. You know what? I, I, and that will be the case. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the way it's that's going to remain, normal. no matter how fast it goes and how mm-hmm. slow we react or mm-hmm. how much we know and so on and so forth. We're going to try our best and, and, and because that's what we do or that's what we have, yeah, you but, know, organizations to do. And there mm-hmm. are people like Rama who will point out things that we're missing and then we'll try to fill that gap and so on and so forth. But it's going to go fast mm-hmm. and it's going to, uh, you know, things are going to change in ways that we're not necessarily aware of because that's that happened years ago, mm-hmm. right? So... It's, yeah. it, you know, the thing that we recognize has changed mm-hmm. happened years ago is what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Sure. You know? So, okay. So there it is. But mm-hmm. uh, what exactly is the problem here? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the problem to me is that it, we don't seem to, well, it, changes happen slower. That's a given uh, in the past. You know, we had the printing press. It took hundreds of years for it to be, uh, you know, uh, spread out around the world and have the impacts that it has. Um, and in some parts of the world, it's still not, uh, you know, the printed text uh, has maybe been leapfrogged right into the digital. Uh, but the digital has been very rapid and it's obviously changing cultural practices very quickly. I mean, there's businesses that have been, you know, coming and going very quickly that have been very iconic and, and uh, shaping our culture. Um, and if you go back even further, uh, you know, ancient uh, history of our our species there would be cultural practices that would change in ways of like farming for example and uh hunting and gathering what have you things that we did that because it took such a long time for it to get within our culture it started to actually have take shape within our bodies as well i mean within our genes and within uh uh, so it it kind of roots itself and uh, becomes uh, somewhat more internalized the changes that are happening now, there's not enough time for that because it happens not within generations, within I mean, a timeline. Is, but it, it's but a different challenge is what no, I'm saying. I'm not the, saying it's, it's, it's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying it's a different way that we're, we're comporting ourselves with the world. Uh, uh, it's within a lifetime as opposed to lifetimes. But this is a dialogue with no function, Why? it seems to me. Mm. It, it because it is uh, it's it's in a realm of complexity. It's mm-hmm. you know I mean and and I'm not giving up. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is uh, to talk about this, and this was what I was thinking the, uh, the other night, mm-hmm. last night uh, at the event. Um, to talk about it is doing nothing. Oh, I don't agree with you there. Don't you have to? No, because I, I think to to there, there's two there's a couple of other opportunities. Mm-hmm. Okay, one is to be because you know we listen to the Q and A to to be more aware 
and be able to uh, um, uh, operate with more intelligent questions, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, be aware of the fact that you have choices, mm -hmm. uh, to have some sense of impact on you and others. Um, I think that's a focus mm. more than, you know, what's what, the externality, right. right? Because that is a variable that's just going nuts. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and I think relatively speaking, it always has, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's just um, the wrong focus. Mm. I, th I think, you know, the people who are knowledgeable uh, about that stuff uh, like supremely knowledgeable about that stuff, we'll do what they do. They'll do it at us. <laughs> yeah. And we we can we can choose to participate or not participate or participate the way we wish to or well, whatever. We might not be to able the, to, to the ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, I don't know. Well, because like you mean? said, they're thrust upon us these these things uh, quite often, and um, like. You know, Steve Jobs' uh, uh, imagination has been thrust upon us, for, for example, and um, and sometimes the, it's not the imagination of a single person; it's it's the imagination of some kind of a, a corporation, an entity, a, a cultural movement, what have you. And um, I think it's very relevant to to think about this in advance and try to shape how we're going to see it and maybe prepare for it. I, I don't see it as irrelevant at all. I think more people should be doing more of it, maybe. More of thinking about and oh, yeah, yeah, this future it, it, I, I, possibilities of, I, I'm of thinking disruption, about the, yeah. the agility of the individual. Mm. Right. That's it. That's yeah. all I'm talking about. And, 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 and yeah. if if you want to share ideas, that's great. Yeah. But to, but to to dialogue about it, to think that that is um, actually constructive or it's productive and and all this sort of stuff. I mean, hmm. I I love dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's this idea. Let's, if you want to chat, let's chat. You know, but mm. if if it's somehow considered to be, you know, something that is in fact going to influence uh, what Steve Jobs would have done, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, mm. reasonable. Uh, and you know, um, speaking of Steve Jobs, there's yeah. this. Uh, and, and you know, and, and here I am on a you know podcast. <laughs> That's right. And, and being recorded by uh, an Apple yeah, computer. By, by, by an Apple computer. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But there was this talk about him having a reality distortion field around him, and there's a lot of people yeah. that are kind of in his in his ballpark of being charismatic leaders that that, that have this that uh, reality distortion. The reality distortion field. People often talked about. It. I, I didn't personally meet him. Uh, yeah. I was in, in the business with Apple, and I, I think I was pretty much uh, in a room with him once but yeah. but the people that did meet him and that work with him that i'd met they all kind of said this in one way or another it's like they fall into this uh he starts talking and everyone's like, oh yeah 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 you know <laughs> just start you know falling in line the charisma of it but also just the uh, you know the 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 um, the confidence and the, and the sureness of what yeah, he's but talking there's an about. There's but there's also, always, he's there's, also an asshole. That's the other part of it, that he's not really concerned about the feelings of yeah, the there person was a lock that's on the listening door. to them. <laughs> yeah. uh, to it's the like room, there's right? no filters. Hey, this is what I believe in, and, and everyone's going to buy into it. So, I mean, sometimes that works out, but sometimes you get an asshole that uh, tries to devote his energies to something much more destructive than creating you know, wonderful consumer products. Yeah, I guess. But he also, I, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say that he, he seemed to be, speaking of reality and Steve Jobs, he seemed to put a lot of importance on his uh, LSD trips, for example, mm -hmm. that uh, opened up uh, new ways of looking at uh, at the world that he, I think he said something to the effect of uh, he didn't want to hire anybody in a high position of power within the company that didn't, that hadn't been on an LSD trip. Mm. Um, psychedelics, well, for, for the moment, yeah. I'm just using the analogy pill. <laughs> Right. That's that's going to be my drug. Mm -hmm. drug. It, it seems to work. I mean, it helps me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you uh, have an opinion on psychedelics? Or? Um, <laughs> well, you're you're a few years older than me, so you, you lived through the seventies, maybe with a little bit more awareness than I did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I my uh, this gets into. Um, uh, the state of my mind. 
what, what do you mean? And whether or not it's it remains mine or somebody else's somehow, mm. or or in my head or somewhere else. <laughs> Is that the concern? Uh, or? I think so. Actually, yeah. I think. Uh, it's kind of like a cult, you know. It's mm-hmm. like, is is it, it is. really you, at all? You know. I, mean, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, I. Uh, no, that's just yeah. my. That, that that's. I get you. Yeah. My reaction is mm-hmm. It's not particularly about the experience. I guess it's mm-hmm. my fear. Actually, it's again. And I, this goes back to the personhood mm-hmm. code of lenience, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it, and it's interesting that those. I would go there, right? I right. don't want to. I don't want to lose myself, or I have this fear of losing myself, that's which right. may not be the case, as you say. Yeah, and and for me, uh, in my personal case, that's been a very informative and uh, mm-hmm. a growing experience for me to to understand and be comfortable with the notion of not being certain of myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, being in a mode of being where it's like, who am I? I don't know, and yeah. that's okay. This has been the criticism, Robin. You have to lose yourself. Ah. So not in those words. So they but, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I, I really haven't been able to do that fully as well. I'm still too much drawn to this control freak uh, in me that wants to uh, always know what's going on and who yeah. I am. But you know what? It's it's helpful sometimes to uh, just float away and then come back. And uh, it's been helpful to me. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I got to say, I think teaching, um, and, I, and I, I never imagined that I would be teaching anything, but I'm finding mm. it really satisfying in a variety of ways, mm. for one. Um, I'm, I'm, I feel extremely responsible. Mm. Um, and, um, it's, uh, what is it? It, it, I, I've learned many things from it, you know, Mm -hmm. I I can't, I can't even list them. I mean, it's just, um, I, I, I think the thing about it, okay, so just generally I can say that the whole experience is, is is emergent. Like it's just always, it always has the potential for that, and I'm kind of aiming for that, right? So when you say the experience, which experience you're talking about, the the experience in a uh, for the moment a classroom, right? okay, yeah. in that space mm-hmm. has uh, emergent mm. potential, right? Um, yeah. Now that's to the ben- you know, it's benefit to the student, but it's uh, of benefit to me. Like, because mm-hmm. I'm often, you know, surprised, actually. Yeah. yeah. Now, you also spent some time uh, teaching, maybe is not quite the word, but working with uh, maybe, you know, a higher C- CEO type uh, character who's... who's uh, yeah, I think, I, I don't know, I think what's uh, like? one, of the, one of the things I guess maybe I've always done, you mm-hmm. know, obviously I'm, I'm, I, I have... <laughs> Uh, I have a lot of curiosity about all kinds of stuff, but I, I think the other thing is um, back to noticing. I guess I'm listening for mm. as much as I'm watching for mm. um, things that you know don't fit or I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and as it turns out, you know that's helpful in situations where there's a bit of a mystery, you know. Mm. So whether that's um, having to do with um, you know strategy or or the senior executive himself, you know uh, mm. the practice itself could be described as sort of exploring the next level. What's the next level, you know? Mm. And that could be for a successful individual mm. who feels that they have much more to offer, you know, that's a that's a nice question to ask. Mm-hmm. And for an organization, you know, it starts to uh, uh, require, you know, more awareness about, you know, the context of what's going on and who's doing it and so on. So I would say, you know, to focus on, on the um, my role in that case, it was to uh, sort of add some clarity to uh, whatever was going on, whatever the circumstance was. Mm-hmm. And um, perhaps, you know, if, if the situation warranted it, to be creative with some kind of strategic alternative. Or, mm. And, um, and you know, anything that involves creativity is fun. And, uh, yeah. and so, you know, 
and it's something that I've always done. So it it, it was just useful in. So are, in that are, role. You, are you trying to bring uh, creativity to the CEO in a way? Is that you know what I realized? You yeah. know, I did, I did a lot of that stuff, and I. Mm. What I realized was that I didn't have enough opportunity mm. to be creative. So while, you know, I think I was effective in those situations, um, uh, I think I was I was always sort of yearning to to be much more creative in the space, mm. uh, which wouldn't have been uh, helpful. I don't think it would have been unfocused. I think. And too distracting, and inefficient, frankly. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a, it was. Hmm. But it, I mean, it's it's more again. It's more about you know. Um, I suppose my in that case my, my listening ability, something hmm. like that. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up soon. I think. Um, how long would you like to live? How long would I like to live? Yeah. Is there a preferred range of age? <laughs> Doesn't, yeah, I've thought Do you know what? I'd love to live long enough mm -hmm. uh, just to know that there is some level of resolution in both my kids. Hmm. Like they're at, they're at uh, a great, both at a great age, mm. uh, developing strong identities, mm. being faced with uh, some pretty tough things. They're extraordinary. I mean, they, they yeah. yeah. And, um, but I, I, I would like to know that they're just sort of settled as mm. individuals. It's always going to evolve from there. Yeah. So it needn't be, let's say, longer than a week. <laughs> Gonna take at least that, and <laughs> at the top end, you know, by the time they've, yeah, by the time they've resolved, and uh, that's the job, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. I guess that changes uh, when you do have children, probably. and and yeah. uh, unfortunately, payment is death. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Speaking of exchange of value, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. What an opportunity! <laughs> the future, <laughs> the children. Yeah. 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 Well, this is great. Thanks, Robin. Oh, you're welcome. It was yeah, fun. enjoyed that. High five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah.